Welcome to On the Middle East, our Monitor's weekly podcast on the big issues of the day in the region. My name is Ambrin Zaman and I'm a senior correspondent for our Monitor. My guest today is Aisha Sadika, a prominent Pakistani commentator on Southern Asian security affairs and a research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. We'll be talking about Turkey's role in Afghanistan, in particular about its offer to continue to provide security at Kabul airport after the last American troops leave Afghanistan by September 11, as pledged by President Joe Biden. The Taliban, which is swiftly winning control of the country, has said it's opposed to the deployment of any foreign troops in Afghanistan. So what does that mean for Turkey and why is it so eager to pursue what many say is a risky mission? So welcome to our show, Aisha. It's great to have you on today. Thank you so much for inviting so I want to just kick off with a sort of very a basic question. What actual purpose would a, a Turkish presence at Kabul airport serve? They're, they're already there. So um, what's the big deal about this? Why is it important? Well, you know, Embreen, to start with, I think right now, um, I mean, everybody... Um, is getting nightmares with Afghanistan because nobody knows what's happening there. Um, the reason Turkey uh, Turkey's presence is important, important is because everybody's leaving. Everybody's leaving Kabul, everybody's leaving town. And uh, really what we are looking at is departure of the West or NATO from Afghanistan, which had been there for about for, for almost you know, more than two decades. And so what we have in, in the form of, of, uh, of Turkey, Turkish forces, about a thousand odd for, troops there, is one, um, a kind of a promise of some kind of security to uh, the Kabul government, uh, which would otherwise be extremely shaky seeing American leave. Two, it is, um, also a symbol of some Western uh, presence, NATO presence. So, you know, uh, Western pres presence in, 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 in that form. Um, so it's like, while Afghanistan moves on to a new phase, Turkey represents in some ways the end of the previous phase. Uh, and that's why it's it's all very exciting. Um, I mean, otherwise, I don't see that with, uh, you know, with a thousand troops uh, or around that number, Turkey would be able to do much if really there's going to be a, a brutal fight or, over control of Kabul. Well, the Taliban has repeatedly said that it does not want any NATO or any foreign forces left behind. But it's never explicitly mentioned Turkey by name, even though, you know, we all know, and they certainly know that Turkey is in talks with the United States to negotiate some kind of deal whereby they do stay. So does this mean that the Taliban is actually open to the idea of a Turkish presence, perhaps because it's a Muslim country and one that has a history in Afghanistan and a positive image there? And if so, what sort of terms would the Taliban be seeking uh, in exchange for its acquiescence? Because after all, it seems to be gaining control of the whole country. Well, you know, there is a civil war kind of a situation. I'm not, I don't think that we are about to see a back to the 1996 kind of a situation where uh, Taliban were, uh, had, had almost total control of, of Afghanistan. But the reason they're not saying anything about uh, Turkey is for a number of reasons. One, that despite its NATO connection, um, Turkey is still, uh, you know, um, a, you know, a, it, it has a leadership which be believes in pan-Islamism, uh, as do um, uh, as do the Taliban. 
I mean, let's not forget that Taliban have changed over so many uh, decades themselves. And the Taliban that one saw in 1990s, which were more kind of inspired by, I mean, you know, the Mullah Umar generation, which is more inspired by, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the conflict in Afghanistan between and from wanting to stop that and have an Islamic system in Afghanistan. This, these ones are kind of much more comfortable with the pan-Islamist view uh, of Erdogan. Um, so that is one which makes them comfortable. Thirdly, and I think that's more most important, uh, Taliban can never be disconnected from Pakistan. And who has very good relations with Pakistan? It's Turkey. Uh, so in one way, uh, I think this is an ideal situation for Pakistan, that while everybody's leaving, uh, the United States has not left um, Afghanistan to, uh, for example, India, which would have given Pakistan the nightmare. So yes, it's very uh, interesting that on the one hand, the Taliban has sort of shifted course, sort of seeking to you know, seem more moderate as it were, uh, and at the same time, you have a government in Turkey that's much closer to its, as you put it, pan-Islamist vision. Indeed, there's a photograph that's often circulated of uh, Turkey's president in his younger years sitting at uh, the feet of Gulbeddin Hikmetyar. So um, basically, you're saying that the Taliban would be comfortable with Turkey but are there any specific asks it has of Turkey, of Washington, in order to accept the Turkish presence? What would those asks be? I don't think they're objecting to Turkish presence. Uh, so that is going to continue. I think it's more about um, it's more about how Turkey kind of manages the relationship between Kabul and the Taliban and perhaps convinces uh, in the next three, four months till September to actually have the dialogue so that, uh, you know, an interim government can be formed. And uh, Turkey helping the Taliban with a new setup in Kabul, which then in, in minds of the Taliban helps to bring Taliban into power. That's what is expected. That's very interesting. Um, but Turkey is seen as sort of a backer of the Uzbek warlord Rashid Dostum, who's vowed to defeat the Taliban. Isn't that a bit awkward? Uh, but that's where it is. I think there is a lot of negotiation which we are about to see. And, and despite that friendship with, with Dostum, I think it all now depends on who amongst the different warlords and and there is there is several Taliban groups and and by the way let me kind of correct you what you suggested earlier that Taliban have actually changed no Taliban have not changed in fact wherever their core constituency is they are they are forcing people they are punishing you know the the same kind of punishment for women etc they're also having to struggle Taliban at the moment in trying to project that, uh, you know, they can also adapt and they can change, which is one of the reasons they're also talking to India. Uh, but no, I don't think that Taliban have changed, number one. And number two, I think there will be a push and pull and where Turkey's role will be is negotiate bits and pieces of interest for all of the warlords. Um, so some for those them, integrate them, bring them together, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I think the ultimate question will be who would manage to maximize control of, of the territory? If Taliban uh, end up being the force which has greater control, then yes, it has larger stakes. Well, Pakistan obviously is the major player in Afghanistan, uh, and it's widely known to have uh, close relations with Taliban. And so as such, Turkey seems very keen to have Pakistani forces join it at the airport in Kabul. Is it in Pakistan's interest to be there 
and to be there with Turkey? And is indeed the Pakistani presence, given its great influence, a sine qua non for the success of the Turkish mission there? They are together. I mean, Turkey and Pakistan are together in many ways. I mean, even if uh, Pakistani forces do not join Turkish forces, um, that essentially, you know, we are looking at a much more, uh, you know, kind of joining of interests of, of, of Pakistan and Turkey. Um, they are very much together. And in fact, if you know, Erdogan uh, is very popular amongst Pakistani military establishment with the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan. Um, and so I think they will work together even if uh, Pakistani forces do not join. Now, what does it mean for uh, the future of Afghanistan? I think Pakistan had always wanted, uh, since after 9-11, for the United States to depart because it is seen as critically involved in, um, in, 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 in Afghan affairs, it has influence Afghan politics, therefore there is resentment. There are groups within Afghanistan which may not be comfortable for, with Pakistan. And that's where I think uh, Turkey would provide that help, uh, you know, that shoulder for, for, for Pakistan. Uh, but ultimately, what we are looking at is, uh, you know, is a scene where uh, Pakistan's uh, policy, Pakistan's influence in Afghanistan is likely to increase. I mean, I, I mean, between Taliban and Turkey, uh, Pakistan has much to gain. And indeed, Pakistan and Turkey have a long history of military cooperation that goes back to way before Erdogan's uh, term in power. Uh, and at the same time, most recently, they had this experience of uh, helping Azerbaijan, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Um, I think that was something which um, brought them together much more militarily. Pakistan had much to gain. In fact, what happened was that Pakistan, while Pakistani forces never admitted that they were committed in Azerbaijan. Um, they, they were, there was Pakistani military presence in Azerbaijan in that war, uh, hiding behind, uh, behind Turkey. And so I think what the gain, what the expected gain is that they will establish kind of, uh, Pakistan would use Turkey to establish its influence in, in, in Afghanistan and then use that to kind of push into further kind of increase its influence and connection with, uh, with the Central Asian republics. So, I mean, clearly there are other powers uh, in play here, notably China, Russia uh, and Iran. And what are the stakes for those three countries and how does the Taliban, Pakistan and Turkey manage those uh, relationships? I mean, isn't it something of a paradox ultimately that on the one hand, Turkey is positioning itself as a Western power and seemingly offering to help out in a bit to restore its uh, very poor relations or let's say deteriorating relations with the United States and then perhaps find itself in a situation where it's enabling uh, China, Russia, and Iran in, uh, in Afghanistan. How will that all work out? The important fact is that United States left. And United States, at this point in time, every country is trying to get the most out of uh, a bad situation, definitely NATO, definitely um, United States. So now what United States would want to see is uh, at least the sense that some of what it left behind has been kept. So the government in Kabul, at least some civil liberties, right, women's rights, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know how long that's going to continue. So but what Turkey, now it's interesting that both countries, Turkey and Pakistan, are both pretending to be uh, supporting the West while they're actually playing a different kind of politics. What are the interests of, of, of China and Russia at the moment? 
Afghanistan, uh, China, uh, sorry, Russia, when it was uh, the Soviet Union, it was badly bitten. It has come into Afghanistan, it has taken the beating, it went back, it's not interested. It had originally, we know it had come in, invaded Afghanistan in 1979 in order to protect a soft underbelly, which is Central Asian republics. It's still interested in, in, in kind of keeping Islamists out of Central Asia, uh, and which means, uh, you know, there are the political issues where it comes to Muslim population. The same goes for China, and that is their primary interest. The secondary interest, of course, is natural resources, which I think they will be able to exploit as time comes. I don't think China is in a hurry to do it at the moment, um, nor is Russia has that kind of comparable capacity. Uh, so I think recent natural resources, they'll leave it at, at, at that. But I think what Turkey and Pakistan are going to do is become brokers of peace in the region. So sell uh, peace to Russia, China, whoever in the region wants it and say, look, we are the ones who can guarantee, you can talk to the Taliban, we can guarantee peace, so you come to us. Uh, Iran is of course the odd one out. Um, I mean, initially, Pakistan was the one who kind of, uh, kind of introduced Taliban to Iran. Uh, but that is a space which now Pakistan wants to reclaim. So there will be that tension there. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 my uh, fear is that you will have, again, we'll be back to sectarian tension in the region. Uh, that is something to watch out for. So are you basically saying that this mission for Turkey isn't as risky as many uh, critics of the Turkish government make it out to be? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, look at the cards in the table. Uh, there, is, uh, there is acceptability, uh, this pan-Islamism business, there is Pakistan, um, there is the strategic connect between Pakistan and Turkey. I don't think that the Taliban are necessarily going to treat the Turkish military the same way as with the United States. And I think one of the countries that has to watch out and which will probably, uh, which doesn't have communication, by the way, with that level of communication with Turkey is, is India. India has stakes, India has development uh, stakes, and it has development projects, but not I would say huge development stakes uh, in uh, from from 2000 uh, to, to th from 2012 onwards. It has spent about three billion uh, dollars um, in 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 uh, Afghanistan, and that these are projects which need to be protected. But uh, and and also, I mean, India would like to have continued influence, and that's why it's meeting the Taliban. That's why it's having this conversation. But I think Turkey definitely is in a far better position. Well, it's very interesting that you bring up India because the Indians are very uh, upset with Turkey over Kashmir. And uh, you, you periodically read these, I would say, slightly overwrought articles in the Indian press about how, you know, Turkey is sort of sowing discord and in inside Kashmir and, you know, acting in concert with uh, Pakistan. The thing is that during this period when Saudi Arabia and a lot of Middle Eastern countries were kind of looking aside while things were uh, happening through 2019 uh, and 2020 in Kashmir, uh, Turkey was one of the countries that gave statements and, and to the point that the Pakistani prime minister uh, was much, you know, was was eager to kind of go to Turkey for for a for a conference uh, and stopped at the last minute uh, when there was pressure from Saudi Arabia. But now that is also another change that we are looking at. Uh, that Saudi Arabia has also kind of slightly distanced itself uh, by default, uh, not by design, from uh, United States. So it also needs Pakistan's help. So that is not that kind of a problem. Um, but India definitely um, is the one country which should be worried. And uh, what it needs to do is that while promising 
it may get into a conversation with the Taliban about uh, continued investment in, in Afghanistan and uh, being allowed to uh, kind of operate, operate its different projects there. But I think without United States, India is like a fish out of water in Afghanistan. And uh, the Turkey-Pakistan combination is uh, going to take Afghanistan in a different direction. Gosh, well, one last question, Aisha. There are these uh, media reports unsubstantiated that as it's done in Libya and in Azerbaijan, Turkey is planning to deploy Syrian mercenaries in Afghanistan. Does that make any kind of sense to you? And do you think the Pakistanis, the Taliban, or indeed the Americans would be okay with that? Or is this just speculation? Well, if that is, uh, you know, there'll be different rumors, there'll be a lot of conspiracy theories. I think, forget about uh, forget about Americans, Americans will definitely not be happy. Uh, I think uh, other regional states on which uh, Pakistan definitely depends and the region uh, at large depends like China and Russia will not be happy. Um, remember Russians were also operating in, in, in bombing uh, Syria. And if you bring Syrians, then uh, this is going to kind of will be bringing back the pre 9 uh, 911 uh, afghanistan uh, you know into into focus um, you had all the middle eastern militants that had gathered in afghanistan turning it into a huge hub of uh, violence and extremism now United States and the West can protect itself. They can close down their borders, not issue visas, et cetera. But hey, uh, China and Russia, which are growing and which are big uh, countries, China is definitely a big economic power. That will be really concerned. So I think there is a conversation to be had with uh, how Turkey and how much leverage Turkey will have in bringing back these different players into uh, into Afghanistan. Well, Aisha, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating conversation. Um, and I hope to have you back on our show again. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the discussion. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders, and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here, On Israel. I'll monitor. So this brings us to the end of this week's podcast. We look forward to being with you again next week on the Middle East.